Bible, if you would, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to try to move through the preliminaries very quickly so as not to um, dilly nor dally. I've got a lot of notes here. I've got a lot of things, a lot, a lot of scripture. Last week I preached on prayer and waiting on the Lord. And I use Gideon as an illustration. Today I'm going to preach on waiting, not waiting on the Lord, but trusting in the Lord. And again, I'm going to use Gideon as an illustration. When I say the word trust, uh, in banking uh, or legal terms, a trust is something that you can set up. It, let's say that as part of your will, a certain part of your estate or the money from that estate went into a, an account at a bank. A bank will normally manage the trust. They charge a little fee, percentage from the trust. And uh, of course, it's, it's in their best interest, their benefit, because they use the money for investments and so on and get a return off of it. Uh, but the money there that's in a trust is there forever and if, especially if it's an irrevocable trust, and it cannot ever be taken away. And with some people, they put so much money in that the money actually is, they're able to gain interest from the money and the trust can build. There are people who put money in as part of their will or their estate. They'll have a trust, let's say, to a college or a university or some charitable organization, that charitable organization will then will receive maybe a million dollars a year from that trust. And because that trust has money in the bank and it just keeps on growing, what's happening is, is that the original amount of money is still in the bank. The, the proceeds that the trust people get is but the interest from that that comes in every year. So the original money stays there. But basically, it is, a, it is a person saying, I trust this bank to keep this money and only use it for what I want it to be used for. And by law, that's how it has to be. So that word trust is a legal term. Now when it comes to God, the word trust is a faith word. If I were to ask you this morning, how are we saved? We could quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are we saved through faith. An alternative word that could very well be used in that verse is trust. For by grace are we saved through trust in God. That if we at any time in our life, whether it was like me when I was nine years old, I asked Jesus to save me, forgive me of my sins, and to keep me until the day that he's going to redeem me from this world and take me home, then I have taken my soul in my eternity and I've put it in the hands of God as a trust to God. God is the trustee. And if God said that He'll hold it until we are ready to redeem that trust, He means He will hold it. God is legally bound to hold it. And there isn't anything that can separate us from the salvation that God promised to give us. I don't care if you were 8 years old, 9 years old, or 50 years old. Or on your deathbed when you got saved. God promised that He would keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. That's a trust. Uh, you may have heard this on the news. Um, Britney Spears is suing 
over the money that she earned as a child. You know, a lot of the child stars back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, they didn't get a really good deal because their parents had access to the money they made and a lot of times the parents spent all the money. But they changed the laws in California and other states so that the parents could only receive a portion of what a child actor made. The rest of it went into a trust. And when they were 18, the, who was the two twins? Um, the Olsen twins. They were multi-millionaires by the time they turned 18. And when they turned 18... Every dime that they had earned as child stars. I mean, they made videos for years. Kids loved them. They ate that stuff up. And appearances and everything else, all that money was kept for them. And when they were 18 years old, they didn't have to work a job the rest of their life. They had that much money in the bank. So we could rightfully say that trust is part of our salvation. If you say you have faith in God, it means that you trust Him, that He will not lie to you, that He will not leave you, that He will not, um, he will not break His part of the terms of the contract. And when you get to heaven, the thing that you handed to God, which is your soul, he is keeping for you on that day and He will give you everlasting life as a result of it. So, the, some people ask, well, why can't I get saved before I die? Number one, you don't, unless you're on death row, you don't know when you're going to die. Number two, since you don't know you're going to, when you're going to die, it is then wise to commit your soul unto God at the earliest stage possible in life. As we've found out, you can die at 16. You can die at 20. You can die of cancer at age 30. People do it. Since we don't know when we're going to leave this world. My wife has bought an insurance policy on me. I don't know when I'm going to die. But I want my family, I want my wife taken care of after I leave this world. And the insurance company that we use, we've done business with them for years. They have the, the premiums that we've put in. And we have put that in a trust so that they're holding it until the day that I die. And on the day that I die, they better write my wife a check. I'm not saying I'm going to come back down and get them for it, but they better do it. But sometimes it's not easy to trust in the Lord. I know this to be true. I've been through situations in life where I... I didn't trust the Lord like I said I was going to. And God had to get me over that. Let's read uh, in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, for the sake of time, let's go to verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, Second Samuel 22, I want you to turn there very quickly. When you get there, say amen and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. And you, you pray for me that I can pray this in a timely manner. I'm trying to, I really am trying to um, uh, maybe kind of expedite the services a little bit. I don't want to, I don't want to get to moving so fast that we, um, 
that we withhold the Spirit from doing something in our presence. Um, but I don't want to just keep, I could stand up here all day and preach and preach and preach and preach and preach. And I know sometimes our ability to listen wears thin. I get that. But these things are important. When, have you got Second Samuel 22? Say amen. amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, help me to preach this. Help me to be a good steward, Father, of the time that we have. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to hinder the Spirit. Uh, Lord, I only want to do what you ask me to do or what you have to say through me. Not much more, not any less than that. I want it to be a blessing to these people. I want them, Father, to be willing and ready to hear it. And Father, Lord, um, I just pray, dear God, that you would lead the service. You could get us out of here at noon. It'd be up to you. You could make us wait till 1230. That would be up to you. Father, if you really got a hold of our hearts, we could sit here till 130, 2 o'clock. I wouldn't mind that. Some of the people, Lord, maybe they just can't sit and listen that long. I understand that. So, Father, I just, Lord, I just give you the service. Let you take charge. But, Father, instill in us that when we pray and you don't immediately move to answer our prayer, teach us, Father, as we learned last week, to wait on you. And teach us, Father, to trust you. That you will do what you promised you would do. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Second Samuel chapter 22, verse 1. Listen to what David said. David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies. I want you to think about who your enemies are. Your enemies are principalities, powers, devils. You have, you have devil enemies. You might have people on this earth who are your enemies. There, there might be people. I know for a fact that there are people in both Turkan and Samburu counties that absolutely hate what we're doing. And if they could find a reason to shut us down, they would do it in a heartbeat. They've tried it already. They hate us. They hate us because we're preaching the gospel that makes men free. Not a gospel that puts men in bondage to a religion. And there's a lot of that out there. So your enemies are could be real people. Your enemies could very well be your own flesh. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock in Him will I trust. Now, I think we've learned already not to put our trust in government. Amen? Amen. Not to put our trust in judges. Amen. Not to put our trust in politicians. But as Christian people, we live in this land. I know for a fact that most of Washington, D.C. is corrupt beyond fixing and so my trust is no longer in the government bureaucrats of this country nor most of the elected officials who are supposed to be held accountable by the American people at the ballot box but when those very people stuff the ballot box then they're not accountable to us anymore so I don't have a choice but to trust God to do something about it. 
He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. You know what that means? The Bible says in Revelation 5 that the lamb stood there and he had seven horns on his head. Now that sounds kind of odd, but he had seven horns. Now let me ask you a question. Who in here would be willing to face off head to head with a rhinoceros? Anybody? Any takers? Much less something that came at you with seven horns. And that's, look at what he's saying here. He said, he is my shield and the horn of my salvation. What do animals do with those horns? They move out all the opposition out of the way. Amen? Uh, it, watching some of these videos I watched, I know a very popular god in India is called Ganesh or Ganesha. He is the elephant-headed god. He has big tusks coming out, a big long trunk, and he's got a human body. And he is the god for them that supposedly removes obstacles out of your way. I don't want a beast to be my God. I want God to be my God. Amen? He removes my obstacles. My refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. Verse 4. I will call on the Lord. Romans 10. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Joel chapter 2. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts chapter 2. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So David said, I will call on the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. When the waves of death come past me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. By the way, it is not a sin to be afraid and don't let anybody on the stupid internet tell you that. Oh, God won't do anything for you because you have fear and God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. Your fear is keeping God from doing anything. That's baloney. That's made up doctrine. That's nonsense. I'll even show it to you from the Bible. He said, when the waves of death compass me about, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me in my distress. Not when I thought positive thoughts, but in my distress. I called upon the Lord and cried to my God. You know what that is? That's prayer. And it's prayer that doesn't know all the right words to say. It just says, God... Help! In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and He did hear my voice out of His temple, and my cry did enter into His ears. In 2 Kings chapter 18, you can turn there if you want, but I want to keep reading for time's sake. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 29. The story is that Hezekiah is the king of, Is of Jerusalem, and God said there was not a king that trusted God more than Hezekiah, nor that did anybody come after Hezekiah that trusted God as much as Hezekiah did. Hezekiah was a very godly man. But Sennacherib sent down his troops from Assyria, and they surrounded the city of Jerusalem. Their, their goal back then, the way they did warfare then, is that, that if they had a fenced city, then they just surrounded the city with troops who were well supplied, well fed, and while those troops had plenty to eat, because they had cut off the imports into the city, slowly but surely their goal was to starve everybody out and weaken them so much that they just gave up and surrendered. And so Sennacherib comes in and he says, don't let your king deceive you in telling you that we can trust in God. He said, I have destroyed many cities who had many gods and their gods were not able to save them from me and your God is not able to save you from me either. Look at what he said. Thus saith the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you. This is uh, 2 Kings 18, 29. For he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord. Now let me tell you, there is always going to be pressure from Satan, from 
Satan's agents, which are family members, supposed friend. Job had friends that counseled him wickedly. Family members, friends, co-workers who will tell you, don't trust in God. God's not going to do anything for you. I worked with a man. I, I always kind of liked him, but he was very arrogant. And his dad was probably worse than he. And he would always tell me what his dad taught him. He said, my dad taught me there are no miracles and there's no salvation. There's just discipline. In other words, I save myself. I don't ask anybody else to do it for me. What a shame. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. He said, Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me, buy a present, and come out to... Remember, remember Gideon last week? He offered a present to God, and did God accept his present? No. That's how Gideon knew it was the right God, because that God didn't demand a present. Has a, this, this guy says, offer me a present, a gift, and I'll have compassion on you. He wanted the spoil. He wanted money. That's nobody to serve. And so he said, uh, make an agreement with me by a present and come out to me and then, er, then eat ye every man of his own vine and every one of his fig tree and drink ye every one of the waters of his cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land. Well, if it was a land like their own land, why don't they just stay in their own land? He was lying through his teeth. A land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, olive and of honey, that you may live and not die, and hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. What was it the forefathers of our country said? Live free or die. And I can tell you, I've sized it up. I don't want to live. I wasn't born in a communist country and I wouldn't move to one. And I certainly don't want this country turned over to that. We are either going to live free or we're going to die. Amen. Amen. And he said, Hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Now how did that deal turn out? They took that before the Lord and they spread the letter out before the Lord and they said, Lord, you see how he blasphemes you and how he is trying to get us to leave you and walk away from you and become slaves to him? Now, God, we just implore you. We trust you. We ask you, God, to deal with it because we have no power against it. The Bible says an angel of the Lord came that night and smote every man, every soldier in their army. They laid out in heaps dead the next day day God delivered them now I got a bunch of psalms to read in fact I couldn't stop putting psalms in this sermon what do I always tell you about the book of psalms it's a medicine cabinet and, and take a look and listen to what I read offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord now let me ask you a question what are the sacrifices of righteousness do you know what that is what that means is you do the right thing even if it costs you everything you have. You do the right thing even to your own hurt. That's a sacrifice of righteousness. It says that I'm going to live right, do right, be right, speak right even when people aren't looking. I did it again. I slammed into a guy's mailbox, busted his mailbox, a couple Saturdays ago. I've done this before, I'm good at it. I took out a piece of paper and I wrote, my name is Mike, my number is such and such and such and such. 
I'm the one that busted your mailbox. I apologize for this. Please call me and I will replace it for you. Now, I didn't hear him call for a long time, but several days, and I knew he came back because the message was gone off his front door. Well, one day we pulled up and he had stuck a new mailbox on there. And I thought, well, he went out and got one. Maybe he's not going to call me. Well, he did. And he said, um, he said, you know, I appreciate you. When I, when I got there to pay him for the mailbox, he said, I appreciate you leaving your phone number. He said, I've had that mailbox busted off about three times now. You're the first person that ever stopped and left a phone number, offered to pay it back. And I said this to the last guy that I hit his mailbox. I said, I'm a Christian. <laughs> and I believe in doing what's right, even if nobody's looking. Years ago, I did this. This old man lives on B Highway. I did that to him. And he said, you ain't real. And he called his wife. He said, honey. He said, you like pickles? I said, well, I like bread and butter pickles. He said, honey, go get him a jar of bread and butter pickles. I got a jar of bread and butter pickles out of that deal. <laughs> That's a sacrifice of righteousness. You do the right thing even when nobody's looking. Amen. Put your trust in the Lord. Psalm 511. Let, but let all those who put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy. Those people who were singing those songs a while ago, they were rejoicing because they had asked God for help and God sent help. Amen. Thou defendest them and let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. Psalm 9.10 And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Psalm 11.1 1, In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. See, that's... That's what, that's what spirit hits me a lot. Mike, get out. Run, 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 run away. Leave. Don't tell me that. I've got my trust in the Lord. Psalm 13, 5. I've trusted in thy mercy. My soul shall rejoice in thy salvation. Raise your hand if God has forgiven Every sin that you've ever committed, including the ones after you got saved, raise your hand. Hands all over the building. <laughs> Psalm 17, 7. Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. By the way, what's in God's right hand? A book. How's God going to save you? With this book. Psalm 1830, as for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust Him. See, He's connected the word now with this thing. Psalm 22, 4, our fathers trusted in Thee, they trusted, and Thou didst deliver them. They cried unto Thee and were delivered. They trusted in Thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of man and despise of the people. Now, here's, here's one of your biggest obstacles to what you're reading here in the Psalms. One of your biggest obstacles is the devil is, while you're reading this, the devil is reminding you that you don't qualify for these promises because you've sinned. And yet, these promises are made to those that sin so they, because they know they can trust God to be merciful even though they've done wrong. I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of man, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn, they shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. By the way, Psalm 22, who is that written of? So, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you how it starts out. Psalm 22 starts out like this. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who is that? It's Jesus. Psalm 31, 19, Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Psalm 34, 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Psalm 34, 22, Oh, Lord, the Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. 
Psalm 44, 5. Th uh, through thee we will push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread under them that rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. But thou hast saved us from our enemies and hast put them to shame that hated us. Psalm 49, 6. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. None of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give God to a ransom from him. Which means that if you've got money, don't count on it to save you. And you cannot use your money to save somebody that you know is lost. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceaseth forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. Psalm 52, 7. Lo, this, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. Psalm 60, 56, 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Psalm 56, 10 through 11. In my God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. And God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Amen. Now what he's saying here is that in spite of what the world says to you about how wrong the Bible is, in spite of what some preachers might say to you about how wrong the Bible is, you can say, in your word do I put my trust. I don't know that I can trust people, but I know for a fact I can trust God's word. Now, turn to Judges chapter 6. This is lean not unto thine own understanding. There's a verse, what is that in Proverbs? It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. You see, I mean, I just, I was having such a good time yesterday putting all, I, putting all these trust verses in there. I figured at some point I'll have to stop. Because the Bible is full of verses that teaches you trust God. Trust God. Trust in the Lord. Trust in His Word. Trust in His salvation. Trust, trust in His mercy. Devil's telling you, you've sinned too much. You've gone too far. God's not going to forgive you. How about trying, at, when you hear that, say, God, is that true? God, will you forgive me yet again? And watch and see what God does. Amen? Judges chapter 6. Now this is still Gideon. Gideon has, has been told by the angel of the Lord that God is with him. And God is going to use him to deliver him from the power that the enemy forces had over the people of Israel. So Gideon goes out and he makes the cakes and he brings the kid and the broth. And you know, he, pours, he tells him to pour out the broth and he does. And he says, put the meat and the cakes on a rock. And he did. And the angel of the Lord put his staff down upon the rock, consumed it all in fire. It turned to ashes and blew away. And Gideon then realized this is the right God because this God didn't accept my gift. So now watch this. In Judges chapter 6 verse 25, God's going to ask him to do something that will nail it down that Gideon is going to serve the Lord. Watch what he says. Verse 25, It came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath. His father had an altar to Baal. And cut down the grove that is by it. The grove was a flower garden with an idol of Ashtaroth, the, the goddess of fertility. Or, or should I say the Virgin Mary in a garden. 
And build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place. And take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took ten men. Ten's a number for God's uh, dominion. It's a number for the Ten Commandments. Other, and the Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, but he did it by night. Now let me tell you what this altar to Baal in this grove means. His father had taught him, because his father stopped believing in the Lord. And his father started believing in Baal and Ashtaroth. And he said, son, if we want good crops, we're going to have to trust in Baal. We're going to have to trust in the fertility goddess. We need to build idols to them and sacrifice to them and sacrifice in the groves. And that was the old way. God hated it. What that means to you is, whatever way you were used to, to trusting in before God dealt with you, you need to get rid of it and start learning how to trust God's way instead. You know why it's so hard for a rich man to get saved? Because even after a rich man, you know, he might pray a prayer, he still wants to use his money to get himself out of all of his problems. He still wants to hobnob with the... With the um, with the mayor and the city council and the judges. Play golf with them so that his business can run illegally. But they won't throw the book at him because he's got them all in their pocket. That man will always trust in his own understanding and he will never trust God. And so God tells Gideon, Gideon, we're going to burn that down. We're going to put a stop to that right now. Now, if you want me to be your savior, then you're, I'm not going to let you put your trust in anything else except me. Now, in verse 28, when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down and the grove was cut down by it. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, Who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, had done this thing. If I was Gideon, I would have wrote my name in the blood of that bullock. Gideon did this. And so, um, then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, this is verse 30, that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. They were telling Joash, kill his own son. Joash was willing to do it. Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will you plead for Baal? Will you save your God, Baal? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning. If he be a God, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. If you were to go into the Catholic Church here in town, Sacred Heart Catholic Church right across the way here, walk in their service, take their statue of Jesus and Mary, and bust them down on the ground, they'd practically kill you. Oh, oh he's killed him! Oh, he's killed Mary! If Mary was such a powerful God, Mary wouldn't need anybody. In fact, Mary wouldn't even be busted. If the idol that they had in their church was, such, was a real God, then why do you need men to save God? It's the other way around. God saves men. And that's what Gideon's dad was saying. Are you going to plead for Baal? What are you going to do? Save Baal? If he be a God, let him save himself. If he's a real God, then he'll kill my son. And he left off talking to him. Verse 32, Therefore on that day they called him Jerob Baal, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. 
Now, Judges 6, verse 36, and I'm going to be done. Is it okay when God doesn't answer your prayer right away, is it okay for you to ask a sign? I believe yes. I believe yes. The first feeding that we did, if you remember, uh, I felt like God was laying it on my heart to feed somebody. I didn't know who it was going to be. Talked to Michael about it. He called Kister. Kister said, Michael, there's people out here dying every day of starvation. Children laying around, their bellies all swolled out. She said, it's horrible. They're dying here every day of starvation. When Michael told me that, I immediately knew that that's what God was referring to. I didn't ask anybody to donate. I didn't, in fact, I didn't announce it. All I said was, someone's given $500. We're going to take that $500. And we're going to do the very first feeding. And I'm, and I'm not saying, please don't misunderstand me. But I'm trying to make a, a point. Is I wanted to know whether or not it was God's will to do it. So the first $500 was mine. Because I said, I'm certainly not going to, if it's not God's will, I'm certainly not going to stand up here and plead with everybody to support this thing if God's not in it. If God's not in it, let it be my loss and nobody else's. In the first feeding, I can't remember how many people we fed, but it ended up being quite a few. We were able to give them a week's worth of food. And the, the outpouring of appreciation and just to see the people's faces was enough to tell me that God was in it and that we ought to proceed with this. That was my fleece before the Lord. And Gideon is just like us. He can't read God's mind. He doesn't know the future. He doesn't know one day from the next what's going to happen. So Gideon did this. In Gideon, verse 36, Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so. For he rose up early on the morrow and thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. But the ground around it was dry. Now, the Bible says, at the mouth of two witnesses or three, let every word be established. And what Gideon's doing here is within biblical guidelines. Gideon said, I want a second witness. So verse 39, Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. Do you see a patient God here? Do you see a God who is long-suffering with us blind people? Because truly... We can't see, can we? Who, who remembers Eldon? The man that came to our church years ago. He had the smartest dog, smarter than Lassie. Smarter than Rin Tin Tin. Eldon would get up. If he had a dentist appointment, he would say, what was the dog's name? Bunyan. Bunyan? Let's go to the dentist. And I mean, Eldon couldn't see a thing. That dog walked him to the dentist's office right to the front door. 
all the way across town. Smart dog. But the real genius of the two was Eldon, who had no choice but to trust that dog. And here's what I'm saying to you. I pray that God leaves you without a choice. And put you in a place where you literally have no choice but to trust in God. We walk by and not by. Which means we have to hold on to God's hand and trust Him that He knows where He's going. God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. And what I'm saying to you today is that in the case of fear or doubt or dispute, or your friends, family, neighbors, co-workers, even maybe, watch this, even church members and maybe some preachers, Telling you that you ought to do it this way, you ought to do it that way. Well, that's fine. You, I'm glad you got your religion. But that's not really how you're going to get by in life. God is here to tell you that's the only way you're going to get by in life. And when you are afraid and when you are worried that you want to be sure that you are following God. Preacher Golf helped me with this. The night I asked God to put me in the ministry, he said, Mike, just like Samuel, God called Samuel four times. He said, I'd rather have God call me four times and know that he called me than to think that he called me one time and make a huge mistake by not doing what God wanted me to do. So when it comes to trusting the Lord and waiting on the Lord, if you need a sign, God tells you it's not wrong to ask for one. And trust Him. But if He does that for you, you better be ready to follow the Lord wherever He leads. Amen. Michael's grandma, bless her heart, she's now in heaven. I don't know how our I don't know how our ministry is going to get by now. For it was her who convinced me while we were stranded in London, our first trip to Kenya, that God wanted us there. Because after being stranded in London. I said, well, we got visas. Let's go see the queen. Let's go see Big Ben. And then let's go home. Michael called his mother and said, Mother, we, we're having a problem. We're stuck in England. We don't think we can get out. The, only, the next flight available is 10 days from now. We don't know if we'll be able to get out of here, much less make it to Kenya. His grandmother went and prayed. Got back on the phone a few minutes later and said, Michael, I went and prayed to God about it and asked Him to get you all here. Michael, God has said that all 12 of you will be in Nairobi tonight. He said, okay, Grandma. He went back to the British Airways desk. Don't go to American Airlines. <laughs> British Airways desk. The lady typed on that computer, clicked on that mouse for an hour, and finally she did this. And said, I don't believe it. 12 seats just opened up British Airways flight to Nairobi. It leaves in one hour. You better get there in a hurry because they're closing the doors. We were in Nairobi that night because a dear old sweet lady trusted the Lord. And God heard her plea. And that was the beginning of what God started to do with our church and our ministry in Kenya. And I'll never forget that as long as I live. And I'm nobody special. 
All you've got to do is ask. What's the hurt in that? Amen? I want you to bow your heads for a minute. Now I'm going to, again, I'm going to open these altars up. If you want to come, you come. Let me ask you this. What is it you're afraid to ask God? What is it that you're afraid to ask Him? He's a big God. You might as well give Him big things to do. You could even give Him little things to do to test Him for the big things to do. Certainly nothing wrong with saying, God, I don't, I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know what you want me to do. I don't know what you want for my life. But God, give me a sign. If you're going to make me wait on the prayer, then fine. But I might need help on my weekdays trusting you, God. Will you give me a sign, a token, like the rainbow in the cloud? God, will you give me a token that your answer is on the way and your blessing is coming? God, will you at least do that? God won't have a problem in the world doing that. So this morning... I want you to think of the biggest thing in the world that you can think of that you've been afraid to ask God to do. And then ask Him to do it this morning.